notice a few things that are different. Namely, the first one being, uh, I'm standing up here <laughs> in the beginning of service, and not Elisa or Janae. And so, um, y'all know I can sing, but I'm not going to sing. I just want to. <laughs> yeah. For those of y'all who who have seen me in a few a few uh, cameos, I guess you call them, you know, I've been up here to sing the lead worship through song. Uh, also, you'll notice a few things different in terms of uh, technology today, but no worries. We will continue on with service and worship because uh, long before there was internet and computers, God was always uh, doing wonderful things and people were still having church. So, <laughs> so technology is not a necessity for worship. It is an accessory for worship. All right. Uh, so this morning, what we're going to do, uh, something that we have actually done before um, in a few on a few other occasions um, so oh, I was about to say welcome to people online what about that <laughs> goodness <laughs> um, so we'll do uh, something that we've done before um, instead of doing worship through song we'll do worship through a uh, period of uh, kind of interaction and fellowship uh, here with one another here in the room all right so uh, what we're going to do is, uh, if you have your if you have your phone, if you have something you can write with, you can pull that out. And what I want each of each and every one of us to do, of course, we've just come off of uh, the Thanksgiving holiday, right? So we're all full of uh, full of turkey and full of dressing and ham and, and other things. We've had a good time with family. Uh, how many of y'all went shopping a couple days ago? Anybody went shopping a couple days ago? No. Cool. So, uh, what we're going to do, uh, and this will sort of tie into our message for today, is we're going to take an opportunity to uh, think about, write down, type down in your phone three things that as a result of being thankful, right? So, as a result of being thankful for all of the things that uh, God has done for us. What are three things that you're going to do differently based on the gratitude uh, that you have for what God has done? So think of how good God has been to you. Think of all the wonderful things he's done for you, which are many, I'm sure. And then as a result of the things that you think of, what actions or what steps or what things are you going to do differently moving forward, uh, preparing to go into the new year? We're years almost over, y'all. We'll be in 2020 before you know it. And uh, so as a result, again, of what, or excuse me, thinking about what God has done for you, how good God has been, what three things can you think of that you're going to do differently based on how good God has been to you preparing to go into the new year? All right. So we'll take a few minutes, give you all an opportunity, give us all an opportunity to reflect, to write those things down, and then we will come back and we will uh, go on to the next, to the next part.
So you all have had an opportunity to think and to reflect. So let's now see what it is you all have thought and reflected about. So uh, before we do that, though, I want to uh, read a scripture. And it's actually our scripture for today that I'm going to be preaching from is Psalm 100. It says, Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates or enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. So what have you all uh, thought and um, reflected on? Again, what is God, all of the one, considering all the things that God has done and how good he has been, what are some things that you're going to do differently uh, based on how good God has been to you as we prepare to go into the new year? And you all can just... Either raise your hand or call out what things that you've thought of. Yes, Ashley. and our reaction to life circumstances in light of God's goodness uh, because certainly things could be worse <laughs> and uh, as the old folk will say just keep on living <laughs> you ain't seen nothing yet <laughs> just keep on living <laughs> and you'll see how life how life can turn and uh, go sour at times all right uh, is there anyone else that would like to share Very good. Communing with God is what I hear. Communing with God, spending time with the Lord uh, because he has been good. And, uh, of course, he desires to spend time with us. That's awesome. That's awesome. Anyone else? Brother Jeff. Uh, one thing that first thing that stuck out to me the most was to uh, be mindful of the guidance of the Spirit and to uh, be in a place where you can... Uh, know that the spirit is talking to you so you can be led to do what the spirit wants you to do and also to be mindful of those around you and, and to be in a position to uh, 
be a help, no matter if their mindset is not where it's supposed to be, but, you know, let the spirit guide you to see what's really going on. Those are the two things that stuck out to me, and what I would like to do this year is to be mindful of those around me and to be a help to those. Awesome, awesome. That's good. That's really good. Be mindful of God's guidance by his Holy Spirit uh, and passing on God's goodness to others. Y'all are preaching my sermon a little bit. <laughs> Just a little bit. <laughs> but that's good. That's all good. That's all good. Anyone else? Strengthening my relationship with the Lord so that, you know, you're in a better position to hear and be led by the Spirit. Um, that's an important thing right now. Yeah, yeah. Indeed, indeed, indeed it is. I mean, it's important any time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we follow. <laughs> good, good. Anyone else? response is going to be to be good to others so um you know there have been some some interesting uh situations that have transpired probably over the past couple of weeks where um let's see for how can i say this uh where, where basically you know um you know there have been some individuals that you know kind of burn you you know as that's, I'll just say it like that. And um, in those situations and in those circumstances, it's real easy to become bitter, to become consumed with uh, distrust uh, of other people outside of an in, outside of the individual that 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 burns you, right? Um, and we're not talking about like you know it went and talked to you to you to your friends or a guy and that's not what I'm talking about I'm talking about like legit burn you like owe you some money didn't pay you back or you know said it was gonna do something didn't do it and you know it ne really negatively impacted you um and in those moments it's real say you know well then fine then I'm not gonna I'm not gonna deal with anyone you know here moving forward from here on forward because of how this one person treated me um but what I, what I learned through that situation, one of the things I learned through that situation is that, one, it's not fair to other individuals who aren't that person, right, to walk around uh, distrusting, thinking that everyone is going to be like that person, when that's just, when that's just not true. Uh, but the other thing is that I think it uh, neglects to account for how good God has been to me in light of my shortcomings and my failures and my mistakes and my sin right that uh, even despite the fact that I don't cross all my T's and dot all my I's God is still gracious God is still faithful God is still kind God is still good to me you know I'm, I'm, I woke up the next day afterwards you know I had <laughs> you know I had all of my needs met you know and that's that's all attributed to that's all credit and glory to the father and so um, and as difficult as it can be and as even painful as it can be, you know, uh, cause you feel like, you, you know, at times you feel like you might want to try and get revenge and make that person pay literally at times, you know? Um, but you know, the, the spirit just, just says, you know what? Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Uh, you know, don't seek to, don't seek, um, you know, revenge. Don't seek to, uh, quote unquote, get back at others. But I'm reminded of what scripture says to forgive others and forgive others who spitefully use you to love those individuals, 
that spitefully use you. And so uh, for me, that's that's what I'm going to do. You know, um, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. And so uh, with that being said, let's we're going to go ahead and prepare now to uh, move forward in our service. We're going to pray and then we're going to go uh, into I'm going to give a few announcements and then we will go ahead into um, our message for today. So let's pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for uh, this day that you have given us. You have richly and abundantly blessed us. You have been good. You have been kind and faithful to us, Lord, as individuals. Uh, and also as a church. We're thankful, Lord, for all of the things that you have done from waking us up and having blood coursing warm through our veins to the food on our tables, to the gas in our tanks, to all of the uh, opportunities that you've given us, to the promises and the future that you have for us. Lord, we are thankful. Uh, Lord, life is uh, full of transition. Life is full of trouble. Uh, life even now for some of us is very difficult and trying. Uh, we're seeking to learn the lessons. Uh, we're also uncomfortable at the same time. God. But even in the midst of all that, uh, we have to still stop and pause and count all of our blessings and say thank you. Uh, God, no one is like you. There is no one above you or beside you. Even in those moments where we seem confused and lost, God, you are there with us. Uh, and you promise, Lord, that you will take us through situations and circumstances and that when we go through them, Lord, we will be better as a result of them. So uh, even in the midst of trouble and of stress, God, we remember uh, what is written in Scripture in the book of James that says to count it all joy when we go through diverse trials, when we experience temptation and difficulty. Uh, God, we just thank you, Lord, and bless you for being good and faithful to us. We pray, Lord, that as we uh, move forward in our service, that you would be with us to help us to have ears to hear and eyes to see what it is that you want to say to us this morning. Help us, Father God, to be changed and transformed and renewed in our hearts and in our minds so that when we leave here, we will be renewed in our thinking and in our actions towards others. We'll be uh, more uh, equipped, better equipped to have an impact on our community uh, and on those around us, God. Uh, we just love you. We appreciate you, God. And we look forward to all of the wonderful things that you're going to do in our lives is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. All right. So uh, just a few things by way of announcement. Of course, today is Small Business Sunday. And for the month of December, every Sunday after service is uh, over, we will do uh, a period right after service just in the classroom across the hall where we will have uh, those who are small business owners that have given the opportunity to share about their business, uh, to offer up uh, even uh, some of the items that you have for sale for individuals to be able to support and patronize your business as well. Um, and so be sure to take advantage of that and also be sure to support uh, those who are, uh, of course, there as uh, business owners. All right. Uh, of course, we just came off of uh, Common Meal and uh, actually just came off of Thanksgiving. And so we just want to just want to take the opportunity to say thank you to the Adels for hosting our common meal. You all are uh, such a blessing to our church. We appreciate you guys. Love you all. Um, we also want to just give kudos to uh, Miss Ashley. And uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And, <laughs> and Miss Cynthia, you guys uh, did a great job coordinating everything. Yeah, thank you. Oh, wait, was that was that Miss Cynthia? Who was that? Oh, that was that was Denise, right? <laughs> but yeah, thank you because Miss Cynthia brought the brought the drinks. But <laughs> but yeah, Miss Ashley and Denise, I'm sorry, uh, part of me for uh, coordinating and putting everything together. Uh, Y'all did a great job holding it down uh, for Common Meal, and so we're we're grateful. We're grateful, of course, grateful to God for the rest to be able to just have a week where we uh, kind of had a bit of a break. Um, that was that was good. That was good to have as well. Um, and so, of course, we're preparing now to uh, go right into the end of the year. And, of course, uh, with that, the children are going to be preparing to um, – uh, are going to be preparing to do their Christmas presentation. So uh, for the parents, just to let you all know, there will be times when uh, the children will be excused to go and practice and rehearse for the Christmas presentation. All right. So let's go ahead and let's turn into our message, going to our message for today. 
Um, of course, we're going to be in Psalm 100. And uh, we're going to read the entire psalm. So again, that's Psalm 100. Psalm 100 is, of course, in the Old Testament. And um, in the Old Testament, it's just five verses, as I read earlier. Uh, psalm 100. Now, this is a psalm of thanksgiving. And so uh, being in this season of thanksgiving and celebration, uh, we're going to go ahead and, uh, and read this psalm. So uh, it reads as follows. It says, Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. So I'm just going to preach for a very simple subject today uh, entitled a call to give thanks, a call to give thanks. Isn't it funny how less than 24 hours after giving thanks, people behave as though they have not a single ounce of gratitude. After gathering with family, laughing about old memories, eating a shared meal, and giving thanks to God for all his abundant blessings, people will rush to stand in line at 3 o'clock in the morning. When the door is open, they'll shove one another and fight over discounted items in the store that they'll want to replace the very next year. Folk will spend money they don't have on things they don't need to try and impress people they don't even know and that, quite frankly, don't care. All in an effort to try to fill this ferocious appetite of consumerism and materialism as if we are cogs in the wheel of capitalism. Some will avoid the lines in the crowds by taking advantage of online shopping. Thinking that they somehow outsmarted the game by not being caught up in the crowds and in the lines, they still fall prey to spending too much money on stuff. Now, don't, I don't want you to get me wrong here. I'm not saying it's wrong or it's a sin to shop on Black Friday or Cyber Monday. That's not my point. But I would like to take advantage, because I myself, of course, like to take advantage of a good deal whenever it's feasible. However, what I am saying and what I am trying to communicate is that far too many people cancel out the gratitude they expressed on Thanksgiving Day with poor stewardship on Black Friday. We allow the marketing to muddy our management, the deals and the say, or excuse me, the deals rather to distract us from doing our due diligence when it comes to our finances, and we allow the sales ads to suspend our stewardship. Every year, there are too many people that end up having a red bank account on Monday because of the shopping they did on Black Friday. Just look to the person next to you and say, we got to do better, y'all. We got to do better, y'all. So the question is, what is the remedy? What are some safeguards we need to have in place in order to prevent this from happening? Well, the practical steps to answering that question can be found by listening to the archives of our power module that we just finished on stewardship. Of course, you can go to our website and watch the archive there. Uh, where we talk about not just uh, stewardship around the holidays, as that was our last session during that power module, but we just talked about the concept and the philosophy and the biblical prescriptions with respect to stewardship. Today, however, what I want to do is offer a call for each of us to give thanks because I believe when we are giving thanks, there is little to no room at all to be ungrateful or selfish. Our text today, even though it's brief, is potent and powerful. It offers a simple yet profound message that is designed to serve as a constant reminder to God's people of where our heads and our hearts ought to always be. That message is this, <clears throat> that if you had to sum up Psalm 100 in one sentence, I would say is this, that God's goodness is a call for us to always give thanks. Psalm 100 likely served as an invitation or a call psalm to God's people, the children of Israel, to prepare to worship God. 
in a sense, it primed the pump for worship, if you will. It could be likened to how we come here on Sunday morning and hear music playing before the service starts. The music isn't simply to fill up empty space. Rather, it is to help us focus our minds on what is about to happen next. And in our text today, there are three things that I want to bring up that I believe this psalm helps us to do in orienting ourselves towards thanksgiving. The first thing is that we need to come gladly to the Lord. Come gladly to the Lord. I'm going to do something a little different today. Uh, normally, I'm a little bit more uh, structured and um, uh, didactic in my, in, my, in my preaching, but I want to be a little bit more parabolic today. So I want you to imagine that you've been invited to uh, the birthday party of someone you consider to be a best friend. So get that person in your mind, someone you consider to be a best friend, really close to, and they've invited you to their birthday party. You've received the invitation well enough in advance that you lock it in on your calendar and you decide that no matter what, you're going to be there. Someone asks you to help them move on that day and you tell them, I'm unavailable. A family member asks if you can come help them do some home repairs that day, but you tell them you can't make it. Even the day before, your boss calls asking you to come into work and offers to pay you double your hourly rate. Tempting. But because you have every intention of being present at your best friend's party, you pass. You've taken the entire month to plan what, you, what gift you're going to get them. You've reflected on how grateful you are for their friendship. And you've even prepared to say some special words to your friend on their special day. You're going to show up to the party ready to celebrate your friend. In a similar sense, this is how we ought to rise each day with anticipation to give thanks and sing praises to God. Of course, when we read Psalm 100, the context of the psalm is a psalm of call to worship. As the Israelites would worship, gather to worship uh, God there in the, in the place where they were located. Worship was centered around the tabernacle and later on would be centered around the temple. Um, but the overall or overarching concept that God is teaching through the passage isn't necessarily, isn't limited to worship at a place, but it's really communicating worship of God. That the overall point and structure is about the worship, is about who you're worshiping and not where you're worshiping, if that makes sense. That each and every day for us, we ought to have an anticipation to be ready to give thanks to God, to come gladly to him, it needs to be our desire to serve the Lord with a glad heart, as the psalm says in verse 2. That even despite the struggles, the hard times, the anguish, and the pain, God is still good and worthy of praise. Every day may not be a good day, but every day God is good. And that alone is reason to have hope for trouble to not always last. That is reason to keep pushing and to keep striving. Because God is good, we ought to always approach the day with thanksgiving in our hearts, with praises on our lips, that yes, life is difficult. Welcome to, welcome to, the, uh, welcome to the world. <laughs> Jesus says, if you are going to live in this life, you will have trouble, right? Expect it. The book, you don't believe me? Read the book of Ecclesiastes. That's all it talks about. The vanity of life, the pain of life, the irony of life, uh, all of the things in life that happen that are negative. But the overarching message that we see throughout Scripture is that despite how difficult life can be, despite trials and circumstances, God is still good, and that for us is reason to give him thanks. You know, it's interesting that... Um, Nowadays, when you uh, typically listen to uh, some worship songs, uh, more um, contemporary or uh, worship songs that are very new in their, in their flavor, uh, many times when you listen to them, they are oftentimes focused on uh, the individual, the people that are worshiping. Right? It talks about, you know, uh, me getting my victory and me getting my blessing and, you know, me having this life and that life. And there are even uh, some preachers that are on this, that are on this train too, you know, that uh, have essentially made church and worship 
uh, about people. But worship is about God. That when we come to worship, when we gather for worship, God is the audience, and we are the ones uh, who come to engage in the activity. And this expands beyond our gatherings on Sundays and on Wednesdays, that our entire lives are not about us, contrary to popular belief. You know, the world doesn't revolve around us. Rather, for us, particularly as believers, as Christians, we live our lives to the glory of God. So that when we wake in the morning, us rising in the morning is, an, uh, is a nod to God. Us going throughout our day, having the ability to move our limbs, is credit and glory to God. Us being able to make choices and decisions on our own, that is credit to God. So how then should we respond to God as a result of these things? Well, the first way, as we've said, is to come gladly to the Lord. That when we come to God, we ought to come with the intention uh, to serve the Lord, to be glad and thankful for his goodness, thankful for his salvation in Christ, and to be ready to serve and do his will. Now, this isn't to say that we won't have days where uh, we're not particularly, quote unquote, feeling it, right? That's not to say that. But it is to say that at some point, even in the midst of what we may be experiencing and going through, we're still mindful that God is good. Just because life is hard, it doesn't change that God is still good. Just because life is difficult, it doesn't, God doesn't stop being faithful. Life changes, but God doesn't. God in his character is consistent and stays the same. And so we are to always be mindful that when we come before God, when we wake up in the morning, when we're coming to worship uh, on Sundays, that we're coming gladly. We're coming with hearts full of thanksgiving that we'll say, you know what, God, this week has been probably the worst week of my entire life this year. <laughs> but you're good and you've been faithful. So I'm going to come to worship ready to give you thanks and ready to give you praise. The second thing that uh, a call to giving thanks demands and invites us to do is to acknowledge God's ownership, is acknowledge God's ownership. So there are two types of relationships that I believe teach us more about God than any other. The first is, per, is a parental relationship, and then the second is marriage relationships. In Scripture, you read about how God is oftentimes speaking to his children, uh, Israel in the Old Testament, speaking to the nation of Israel as if they were his children or as if they were uh, like a bride to him. He even uses one prophet in the Old Testament to communicate to them how unfaithful they have been to God by having this prophet marry a harlot or marry a prostitute and use it as this extended metaphor to communicate the lack of faithfulness that Israel has had to God, but that God has had the, uh, the abundance of faithfulness that God has had to Israel. And so in scripture, we see these two relationships of parent and child, but also of marriage. So as it relates to parenting, I want to highlight this one here. I think there are a whole bunch of lessons that we can learn, but one, I want to focus on just a couple that I think are relevant to our message today. So just a few months shy of turning two, my son uh, has learned quite a few things. One of the things that he has learned and is still learning is that his parents are the source for everything that he needs. Food, clothing, shelter, diaper changes, learning, growing, playing, and he looks to us for each and every single one of those things. Now, he may not consciously say to himself, mommy and daddy are the source for what I need, but it's evident in his behavior. Through his words and his actions, he demonstrates that he understands who his source is. It is this demonstration that communicates that he knows who runs the house, sets the boundaries so that he can flourish, but, and not only owns the environment in which he finds himself, but also owns him and is responsible for his well-being. In scripture, Jesus tells his disciples in Matthew chapter 18, verses 3 through 4, he says, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Now, inherent within this concept of becoming like a child is acknowledging God 
as the parent in the relationship and not the other way around. We must know, as the psalm says, our psalm today says, we must know that we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. We must acknowledge that he is Lord. We must trust that he will provide our needs. We must trust that he is the one who will protect us. We must acknowledge and trust that he is the one that will get us through troubling times. We must acknowledge that he is the one who will render justice. We must acknowledge that he is the one who is working in and through us to have an impact in the world. We must acknowledge that he's the one responsible for our, off, for our kids when they're off the chain. We must acknowledge and trust that God is the one who's going to save those for whom we're praying. Right? We must acknowledge and trust that God is sovereign, that God is in control, that he's the one upon whom we trust and upon whom we rely. Why? Because when we give thanks, we're giving thanks not to just some random stranger. We're giving thanks to the God of the universe, the creator, the God of our salvation, the one who has kept us this far, the one who is leading us forward into the future. The one who has instilled and set aside purpose for our lives. The one who's helping us to fulfill and empower us to fulfill vision. The one who's brought us and adopted us into his family. The one who's connected us with our local church. The one who's sanctifying our souls and our minds each and every day. The one who's going to save us in the end and bring us to glory, right? We're, this is the guy, this is the one to whom we are giving thanks. And when we give thanks, we're acknowledging, it's implicit, it's inherent in our acknowledgement that God is owner, that God is Lord, that God is in control, that God is faithful, that God is good. So when we have a call, when we talk about a call to giving thanks, it's more than just saying, thank you, God. I appreciate you. <laughs> right? But it's, God, I thank you. Not simply or merely for what you've done, but for who you are, that's the essence of worship. That it isn't just what God has done, but it's who he is. And who is he? He is Lord. He is owner. And when we come to worship, whether it be on a Sunday or on a Wednesday, we're acknowledging that God is in control. We're acknowledging that God is sovereign. Whether you're waking up in the morning and you're reading your Bible or you're praying in the morning, it's you're praying to the God who is Lord. You're praying to the God who is the creator of all things. You're praying to the God who puts food on your table and in your cupboards, who puts clothes on your back, who gives you the breath that you breathe. That's the God to whom we're praying. That's the God to whom we're giving thanks. So a call to worship, a call to rather to giving thanks is one that invites us to come gladly to the Lord. That when we come into his presence, we come, as, as the psalm says, we come with singing. We come blessing his name. We come offering thanks and sacrifice to him, sacrifices to him of praise. But we also are acknowledging that we are his people, that he is our God, that we belong to him. He's responsible for us. One of the interesting things, if you ever took the opportunity to learn or look up uh, the relationship of a sheep, or excuse me, a shepherd to his sheep, one of the things that is talked about is that sheep are very dumb animals, right? And of course, I don't mean it like in a pejorative sense, but no, like they're really dumb animals. They don't really have uh, the kind of awareness that uh, they need to have. I've seen, uh, I've seen videos and clips of sheep that are falling into deep, deep pits and deep holes and get caught in thickets and thorns and they can't get themselves out. And you know, sheep wander off from the, uh, uh, from the group, right? But you have the shepherd who is the one who's responsible for the sheep. Right. That amidst the, the dumbness of the sheep, the ignorance of the sheep, the shepherd is watching over them. Right. Then isn't that like us sometimes <laughs> we just we just be as dumb as we want to be. We think we smart. We real dumb. And God is like, you think, you know, what you think, you know, everything you think you got stuff under control, but you don't have anything under control. He said, just wait. There's going to come a time in your life where you think you got stuff straight and you think you got stuff going on and the bottom is going to fall out. So in those moments, what are you going to do? Who are you going to trust? Who are you going to acknowledge as the one who's taking care of you? Scripture would have us encourage us and admonish us, admonish us rather, to acknowledge and trust that God is our shepherd. That we are like sheep in the sense that in relation to and in comparison to God, God knows far more. 
He has far greater power and capacity than we do. So we are the sheep of his pasture. And that's a good pasture to be in. Because <laughs> his pasture is one that is full of all that we need. His, when we're a part of his pasture or, a part or his sheepfold, he is the one taking care of us. When we're a part of his sheepfold, we don't have to worry that we're going to be uh, consumed by carnivorous wolves that are surrounding us to take us out. Why? Because God, we are a part of his pasture. We're the sheep that belong to him. So a call to giving thanks ask, or excuse me, invites us to come gladly to the Lord, also to acknowledge God's ownership, but then thirdly and finally, to recall God's faithfulness. To recall God's faithfulness. I remember growing up, one of the things my parents did not tolerate was bratty behavior. It just was not going to happen. <laughs> Our parents were not about to let us grow up thinking that one, the world revolved around us, that we could always get our way or what we want, and that we could treat people any type of way without any consequences, especially them. <laughs> it wasn't going to happen. There were consequences for bad behavior in the Rogers household growing up. Now, I forget what the specific infraction was that I committed to make my mom upset with me one time, but I do know that it was after a culmination, a combination of things that I had done as a foolish teenager who thought he knew better than she did. That thing, the thing, excuse me, rather, that does stick out of my memory was my mother's frustration and pain as a result of my idiocy. At this particular time in our family, my dad was working full time and in school. And my mom was practically working full time as well as a teacher and taking care of things at home, doing all the cooking and all the cleaning, etc., so on and so forth. My brother and I at the time we were very active in different activities, sports and clubs and school. And so our schedule in the house was very, very tight. Talking about going from school to practice to home to do homework. And then it's pretty much straight to bed after that. Now, because of how crunch things were, my mom would oftentimes ask us to do very simple tasks to help around the house, whether it's do laundry or do the dishes or take the chicken out of the refrigerator to thaw. I mean, you know, all, all of that kind of stuff. Sometimes I would do them and sometimes I wouldn't. Although it was more so that I wouldn't, right? Just being a forgetful, you know, just, you know, just a dumb teenager. You know, teenagers, I don't mean no, no this ain't no shade to teenage in the room, but. Yeah, teenagers, we be thinking we know some stuff. We won't be knowing nothing. We won't be knowing a thing, boy. Well, one day, my mom had pretty much had enough. And she decided she was going to make it rather clear. She expressed how she felt ignored, taken advantage of, and unappreciated. She felt that her faithfulness to us had been trampled on, and she was right. There really wasn't anything I could say. All I could do was just sit there and take it. After that, though, I did get better at helping around the house, showing more appreciation. Uh, and I even got on my brother about it from time to time, too, because, you know, he was a teenager. He was only he's only two years younger than me. And so he was he was dumb, too, just like me. <laughs> now, what I do want to point out is that it wasn't a fear of being fussed at by my mom or my dad that caused this change in behavior, that that wasn't it. But rather, it was simply recalling and thinking about how faithful my mom was and how much she loved us. That from home-cooked meals each and every single day to washing my filthy baseball uniforms, my mom did it all. And so how dare me to treat my mom's enduring love, consistency, and patience like a cheap trinket? Even more so, how dare we Treat God's faithfulness and love that endures for us as if it were cheap. See, God's grace to us is free, but it's not cheap. Every day we have occasion to recall God's faithfulness and be thankful. Every day we are benefactors of his faithfulness. If you opened your eyes, you're a benefactor. If you have breath in your lungs, you're a benefactor. If you can walk and talk, you're a benefactor of God's faithfulness. If you've got food to eat, you're a benefactor. If you've got clothes to wear, guess what you are? You're a benefactor. If you've got a little money in your pocket, 
You're a benefactor. Even if you just got nothing but two nickels to rub together, you're a benefactor. If you got a quarter of a tank of gas in your car, guess what that makes you? You're a benefactor. If you got Jesus, you are certainly a benefactor. If his spirit is living on the inside of you, you are a benefactor. Since you're alive, you've got purpose, you are in this life for a reason, you are a benefactor. So at no point in life, even despite how difficult life can be, we always have reason and occasion to reflect and recall God's faithfulness towards us. Even when, even if, as the old preachers would say, even if God never did anything else, up until this point, he's already done enough. He's been faithful and consistent and kind and generous enough for us to always give him thanks for the rest of our lives. See, we oftentimes think God owes us stuff. God doesn't owe us anything. <laughs> Why? Because he's already given us the greatest gift in his son. And each and every single day you're alive is a blessing. The reality is we couldn't have woke up this morning. The reality is life could be worse. But God has been good despite the difficulty. And he even uses the difficulty of life to shape and mold us in his image. To shape and mold us into the kind of people that he desires for us to be. So when we talk about a call to giving thanks... We're not just talking about showing up to church on Sunday, singing a few songs, listening to a sermon, and then walking out of here as if we done forgot everything that just happened. No, a call to give thanks is a call to give a lifetime of thanks, a call to give a lifetime of worship, a call to give a lifetime of service to God, a lifetime to make an impact in the community for the kingdom of God. That's a call to give thanks. Remember, you got to come, we ought to come gladly to the Lord. That even when life is difficult, we come thankful for what God has done and for all his blessings. We also come acknowledging his lordship, acknowledging that God is not about me, but it's about you. You own me. Scripture says you own the cattle on a thousand hills and the hills belong to you as well. So everything around me, you own. Everything I see, you're the owner, you're the creator. Everything about me, my person, the fact that I'm alive, is, shows that you own me. If, if you are in Christ, as it says in, script, in the scriptures, it says you were bought with a price. You are not your own. So give your bodies in service to the Lord. We don't belong to us. We belong to the Lord. And then lastly, always recall God's faithfulness. That in moments where the enemy tries to uh, tempt you and tell you that God hasn't been good, or that he's abandoned you and left you, all you have to do is go back into the Rolodex of your memory and think about all the things God has already done. Because here's the thing about God. If God has been faithful before, he's going to be faithful again. God isn't fickle, right? God's not a man that he will lie. God's not the kind of person who's going to love you today and hate you tomorrow, who's going to want to talk to you today but not going to want to talk to you tomorrow, is going to give you things today but then take advantage of you tomorrow. That's not God. <laughs> That's not God. God is good. God is faithful. Amen. God is kind. God is loving. God is generous. He be preaching at home too, y'all. It's funny. It's going be funny. <laughs> But y'all, God is good. And we always have to remind ourselves, even, even though we're saved, even though for those of us that are saved, it doesn't matter. We will forget. We'll have lapses in memory. We'll get caught up in life and allow the storms of life. We'll be like Peter. Jesus invites us to come out of the boat and we're walking on the water but then we start looking at the, 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 the lightning crashing and the thunder rolling and we look at the waves around us. And before you know it, we've taken our eyes off of the one who invited us out into the trouble in the first place. <laughs> Think about it. God says, come to me, Peter, in the storm. Right? 
He doesn't tell Peter to come to him when it's nice and calm and nice and still. He says, no, come to me even in the midst of the storm. And he says, when you come, keep your eyes on me, right? So that in the midst of the storm, we always have an anchor. We always have a right focus. That has to be how we respond to God and to life. That despite what's going on around us, when we step out on life, the storm of life, we're focused on Jesus. Not the storm itself, not the wind, not the rain, not the thunder, not the lightning, but we're focused on Christ. That's the appropriate response, the daily response of a believer. And we trust and pray and ask for God's help in that arena. We don't do it on our own. We don't conjure up or uh, muster up the strength on our own, but we trust God that by his spirit, he's going to remind us of how good God has been. He's going to give us the motivation to get up and go to church when we don't want to go to church. He's going to give us the drive to pray when we know we need to pray, but we don't feel like praying. He's going to give us the strength and the motivation and the, and the desire to give when we ought to give. All of these things the Lord helps and empowers and strengthens us to do. The question for us is that when the call and the invitation to give thanks goes out to you, what is your response going to be? What are we going to do in response to God's call for us to give thanks to him? So that's our message for today. Hopefully it has uh, challenged you like it has challenged me. Hopefully you feel um, just as uh, encouraged but also strengthened. As I do. It is difficult. It's not easy. <laughs> but uh, if it was, everybody would be doing it. <laughs> and as a, as a preacher of the gospel, I preach what the standard is. And then, by God's help, we seek to live according to that standard. Yes, we fall short, but that don't change the fact that that's the standard. <laughs> and so that's what the preaching is for. To motivate us, to encourage us, to, uh, to press on, and to do uh, the Lord's will. So with that being said, we're going to go ahead now and we're going to prepare to uh, get into our reflection groups. We'll get in groups of three. And we will answer uh, the two questions that you're going to see here on the screen in just a moment. Of what stuck out the most to us from the message. But then secondly, what are we going to do differently this week based on what we've heard and uh, we'll take just a few minutes to do that and then uh, someone in your group will lead us through the lead you through the decision questions that you see there on the screen as well and then we'll come back uh, to close out for worship today as we come to the conclusion of today's lesson our hope is that it's been both informative and impactful for you in addition to coming back and viewing this recording again to increase retention, we also want to encourage you to take an opportunity to reflect. That's right. Here at Church on Purpose, it's part of our mission to help people understand their faith and live it. And one of the ways we do that is by taking time to reflect after each lesson. You can join us now in a period of reflection by simply clicking on the reflection button below your viewer, where it'll take you to a place where you can fill out some information and answer the same questions that we're going to be answering here in the room. Number one, what stuck out to you most from today's lesson? And number two, what do you plan to do differently this week based on what you heard? Now, if you're watching from somewhere outside of the Omaha metro area, you can stay connected to everything that's happening in Church on Purpose by liking us on Facebook at facebook.com slash church on purpose or by visiting our website www.churchonpurpose.org where you'll find additional information about the ministry an archive of past sermons and bible studies as well as opportunities to contribute and connect if you are in the omaha metro area we'd like to extend a personal invitation for you to come and join us on location for either our sunday worshiping word at 9 25 a.m or Midweek Worship and Word on Wednesday nights at 6.25 p.m. We look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks again for watching. And until next time, live each day on purpose. <laughs>